All right. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Jazz Is Last Call. I am your host, Brian Zimmerman, executive editor of Jazz Is Magazine. And as always, it is an absolute pleasure to have you join us tonight. Sorry we're running a little bit late. Uh, both I and our guest today were having a little bit of a uh, bedtime crisis with our kids. So parents, I hope you can certainly relate. But uh, we're here now. We're ready to get the last call on. It's going to be a phenomenal show because my guest today is uh, Jasmia Horn. She is a phenomenal vocalist who in 2015 won the Thelonious Monk International Jazz Competition for vocals. Uh, that led to her amazing first disc, A Social Call. Uh, and last year, she followed it up with her even better, uh, in my opinion, sophomore disc, Love and Liberation. Uh, it's a collection of songs that sounds at once classic and contemporary and really deals with a range of themes that are especially pertinent to today's times. Uh, she also just published a new book, Through My Eyes, The Jasmine Horn Approach. She is here. It's last call. What do you say we go one more round with Jasmine Horn? Jasmine, are you there? Hi, Brian. Thank hey, you hey. for having me. You are very welcome. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, Jasmia, as our longtime viewers know, the first thing we do on this show, because it is last call after all, is a toast. We salute someone, some thing, some place, some idea, anything, and we just honor them with a glass here. So I've got mine. Oh, you came prepared too. Right on. Um, so Jasmia, who, what, where, when, why are we celebrating with this class? I have the honor. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> How about for still having jazz music in the tradition during this outrageous of a pandemic that we've yes, gone yes. through for the past four or five months for some of us? So cheers to that. Cheers to that, for sure. And before we go on, we see people chiming in from Facebook with a toast of your own. Yes, please. Write us in, let Jasmia know where you're watching from. Feel yeah. free to share a toast of your own. We'll probably have some questions too for people watching uh, down the line. So yeah, absolutely. Even if you have a question for Jasmia, feel free to write it in. We can maybe get to it on air. Before we get uh, into the good stuff, though, Jasmia, I wanted to quickly thank uh, one of the show's sponsors. That would be Cambridge Audio because people watching <laughs> after this interview, I know you're going to want to listen to everything by Jasmia Horn, I guarantee it. And a good way to do that is with Cambridge Audio. They are hi-fi pro hi products, and speakers are designed to save the world from poor quality sound systems. Uh, jazz fans, you deserve the best possible sound at the fairest possible price, and Cambridge Audio can provide that for you. So you can learn more at cambridgeaudio.com. All right. Myself. Do they have That's good right. <laughs> Yes, they do. Oh, <laughs> Jasmia, the new album "Love and Liberation" is so so good, so Thank so good. You. I I was talking about uh, you know before we hopped on air, uh, my oldest daughter, and I just want to relay a funny story uh, that has to do with your new album. You know, okay. as the editor of Jazz, I get a lot of advanced CDs, and yours is one of them. And I play them. Used to play them in the car with my daughter, like on the way to preschool, just driving her around and whatnot. Normally, she's in her own little world. She's back there looking at the window, you know, singing to herself, playing with her toys or whatever. Put the new album on. And, you know, I play um, when I say, when I, play, when I say, <laughs> play it. She goes through it at the end of the song. Daddy, can you play that one again? Yeah. I flip it back. <laughs> I put it back again. Perfect. Daddy, can you play that one again? Oh, wow. Jasmia, that is the most played song on my iTunes by oh, far. Really? She listens to it all the time. She loves it. <laughs> That's super awesome. It is a great album. And what I really love about it, the whole thing, is it's this awesome, classic, old school standards vibe, for sure. Um, but, you know, with themes that are very much suited for today, like... You know, I'm thinking back on the standards of the Great American Songbook and all the great American Rogers and Hart, you know, uh, Berlin, Gershwin. Um, you know, some of those themes now seem a little dated. Um, some of the, uh, you know, female perspectives, especially in those songs, seem a little dated. There's a lot of damsel in distress, you know, yeah. uh, wooing, that kind of stuff. Um, and I love that your album channels that music stylistically, um, but really, you know, strong females perspective. You know, I'm thinking of the tune, No More. Um, I'm not going to let anybody mess with my soul no more. I'm not going to be the kind of girl that does what she's told no more. Um, 
And I just love that. You don't necessarily get that in Rogers and Hart. So it's really nice to <laughs> bring that perspective to the great American songbook. Thank you. Um, I think it's necessary, really. I yeah. mean, times have changed tremendously. And, you know, um, this time right now, like in 2020, a lot of women are speaking out, you know, for their rights. Um, a lot of black women in particular are, are saying like, you know what? I've had enough. I'm, you know, I'm just as smart. I'm just as capable. Um, and it's time for me to speak out about that. And so for me, I've, I've always felt that I was smart and capable. <laughs> I've never, you know, my parents always, you can do whatever you want to do when you grow up, however you want to do it. You know, they never gave me, um, they never like belittled me or anything. Mm -hmm. No, you can't do that. Right. They never said those things to me. As a matter of fact, I talked to my grandmother a couple of days ago because we lost a family member. And um, to hear that. he told me a story of, about the family member that I completely forgot about me that the family member, the family member was there when this happened. And I completely forgot about it <laughs> until like Friday, this past Friday. I was, um, when I was three, my grandmother sent me to school with a friend of hers um, because she was a kindergarten pre-K teacher and I wasn't mm -hmm. old enough to go to school yet, but I could read, you know, I could sing really well. And I was really good with words, particularly because my mother was always singing and learning lyrics to words because she was a lead singer in the choir at our church. Okay. And um, there was a teacher who was, she, the teacher was reading us a story and um and she was going through like the animals in the book and like, what do the animals say? So she said, okay. you know, the cow says moo and all the children said moo. And you know, what do the sheep say? Bad, and all the children said bad. But you know, this was the nineties. And for some reason, you know, people used to say bow wow, you know? And, yeah, right. <laughs> and so, and so um, the teacher got to the dog and she said, the dog says bow wow. And she said, my grandmother said, I stopped. And I was like, a dog doesn't say bow wow. <laughs> and the whole class was like, oh. and she kicked me out. She was like, go see your, go see your friend. Like she sent me to my grandmother's friend and she was like, Jasmia, it's just, I can't get her to be quiet. She talks too much. She's either talking or singing. <laughs> Speak <laughs> in your mind. Something, you know, to kind of distract the class. And my <sighs> mother said, everybody knew that you weren't going to be able to pull a wool over Jasmine's head. Like they mm. are, they knew you weren't going to be able to just tell me anything because I was going to either look it up or I was going to go and ask somebody. Or if I knew what the truth was, I was going to stand in that. So yeah. I'm like this three year old child saying, no. I rebel. The dog does not say that well. <laughs> that was your first major act of revolution. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah. So let's talk about growing up because you grew up near Dallas, right? Yeah, in Dallas. Kind of like the In Dallas, area. okay. Yeah. Cool. And your family, it sounds like they were musical? Yeah. In the choir, in the church? Yeah. My mother sang in the church. My dad played drums um, and organ sometimes. My grandmother played, or his mother played organs um, and piano. My my. Uh, father's father, so my grandfather uh, still now um, plays guitar and sings right. lead, and he's also the pastor. And then all three of my dad's sisters sing and play piano. So all of my my grandmother's the name the name that I have came from my dad's mother. Okay. All of her children are musical. Okay, wow. And yeah, all, and so yeah. so she was obviously a lover of jazz and bestowed you with this awesome name. Um, yeah, and. Uh, so was there, was it the kind of household, like, was it mostly just church gospel music or listened to everything? Um, a little bit of everything. It was mostly the blues and gospel music and R&B music. There wasn't a lot of jazz. My grandfather really loved jazz. Um, okay. Nat King Cole, you know, he, he liked a lot of the male singers. So we would always hear his music. But during the holidays, we would be, you would hear Johnny Taylor and... ZZ Hill and Bobby Blue Band and BB King and Howlin' Wolf and like all these blues, you know, singers. Yeah. And my grandmother was more so of a gospel, um, like she was a traditional woman, you know, she didn't really like a lot of 
jazz and blues in her house as much as she liked gospel. You know, she was the first lady of the church. And and ironically, my grandfather is the pastor and he listened to more blues than he did gospel a lot of times. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's obviously some overlap, you know, there as well. Um, and yeah, you went to the same high school. Was it Booker T. Washington? Yeah. Booker T. Yeah. Washington. Where? Robert Glasper graduated from there, right? Nora Jones. Yeah. Erica Badu. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now that was all, they were before you, right? I mean, they came because I think we're a similar age, right? Or were you there at the same time? No, I'm a, I'm almost 30. So oh, okay. they're all about 30, 25 years older than me. Oh, right. Yeah. So I wasn't there. Yeah. <laughs> no. Well, no, they look young. So, you know, yes, so we're do. the same age. <laughs> we came of the age when, you know, really, R and B was also in heavy circulation. Oh yeah, um, you know, and was unlike it is now a separate genre, kind of from hip hop. Now everything kind of merges together. But yeah. back then, you had some incredible R and B artists that were doing their own thing. Yeah. You know, and were, were those sounds kind of swimming in your ecosystem too? All the time, especially yeah. Nora Jones, especially Roy Hargrove, especially yes. Lauren Hill, Jill Scott, Roberta Flack. Uh, uh, what's her name? Hathaway, Layla Hathaway. Layla oh, Hathaway, yeah. Yeah. Um, and it had father too. Um, that whole Hathaway legacy. So there was a lot of R and B and soul music, you know, playing around the house, particularly from my mother, you know, uh -huh. at home with my mom and dad. But with my grandparents, it was always blues and, and gospel. So. And so tell me about this Screamo band then that oh. I <laughs> discovered <laughs> during my research, uh, which is also hey, you know. I've, I've, I went through a major you know, hardcore you know, punk phase too. Yeah. I mean, I still have a lot of records from that yeah. phase. Like I, music is music, man. That's it right. Really is. So I, there was a moment in time where, um, I was in a, like a garage band, yes. um, you know, and I had like permed my hair. So like right now my hair is very kinky. Um, but before it was very straight and I had had it, like it was so long. The mohawk was like literally <laughs> about this awesome. high, you know, yes. like, just like, and people were like, how did you get your hair? A lot of gel, a lot of perm. And um, always like, so it wasn't just the music. It was like everything, the hair, the, the makeup. Oh, you the had to live it. Yeah. Um, because I was really like I didn't know much about jazz, you know, mm -hmm. for, for whatever reason. And I'm I'm finding this out more now that I have children of my own. Um, like there is not a combustion of the the diversity of the black American experience and heritage like portrayed in the main media. Mm -hmm. And so I really didn't see going up, uh, growing up a lot of positive um, black people on television, in films, um, on the radio, um, other than like the R&B and blues groups, but a lot of those people were much older. And so people my age, there was not a lot of music, um, mm -hmm. not a lot of film and, and television of you know people who I felt represented me personally. So right. there were different ways that I was trying to find myself. And, you know, being in playing alternative music and being in a rock band was one of those ways that kind of helps me develop my sound in a way and, and my personality. And it was one thing that I had to go and be, that was a part of my journey that I had to take in order to be the person that I am. So there was a lot of kill switch engaged. There was yes. a lot of system of a down. There yes. was a lot of loser and Nirvana. And um, it was, I just, I was embellished in all, all of the music, like the punk rock in um, Antebellum, Lady Antebellum. I mean, there was so much music around me that was um, not jazz and R and B or gospel. So. Yeah, I was in a band for about two years, just screaming and yes. carrying on, you know. <laughs> well, as the Louis Armstrong scholar, uh, Ricky Riccardi, likes to remind me, those early jazz musicians, they were the original punk rockers, you know, because they were going cutting completely against the grain with their yeah. music, you know, doing things that, you know, society didn't know what to do with. Um, so there's a strong lineage of that, you know, all the way through jazz. And you're, you're not alone in going through a... Uh, punk rock phase in high school. I'm, I'm right there with you. I'm sure a lot of our audiences, audience, if you're watching and you went through a punk rock phase, 
let us know. Uh, front face. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, you then, so when did jazz really, you know, kind of a, a serious study of jazz enter the equation for you? What made you want to say, oh, I can do that? You know, I, I want to do that. Uh, one day, as I was talking about my grandfather, he played a record, a Nat King Cole record. Uh, oof, I can't remember the name of the record, but there was a song, and I think the song is called If You Can't Smile and Say No. Knock mm -hmm. me a kiss, you'll never miss when I'm ready to go. But if you can't smile and say yes, please don't cry and say no. When I heard that, I was yes. like, who is this man? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, and I was like, Papa, who is this guy? He's like, that's a little bit of Nat King Cole. And there's like this whole story about how he used to go out and hang out and see him in the clubs and stuff. And he just went on and on and on. And I was like, can I have this? Because it was a cassette tape. So I was like, yeah. can I have this cassette tape? And he thought about it. And then that I think that Christmas he gave me the cassette tape. And then he also bought a CD tape that was the same. So I just have the cassette tape as a collector's album. I don't even play it. Right. And then I have the CD um, compilation so that I can consistently play. But there's some great songs on there. That was the first like jazz album that I actually heard that kind of uh, that wasn't a female vocalist because that there was a difference. Hmm. And then later on, when I started to do research, I as I was going to the performing arts school, because half of my high school career, I studied at DeSoto High School, which is a suburb that I grew up in, which is like right right outside of Dallas. OK. And then um, and then later on, I went to the performing arts school because I begged my mom to go. She didn't really want me to go. Right. That's Booker T. So you had to like audition yeah, and audition all that. Yeah. And it was kind of far away from the house. Yeah. yeah. You had to catch the city bus versus <laughs> Wait, bus. morning. Oh, I know. You know, there's yeah. a lot more 16, 15 year olds. So right. Like, I don't know about that. Um, and there was a teacher there named Roger Boykin. He doesn't teach there anymore, but I, I'm still mentored by him and I still te take lessons with him and stuff. Um, and he was like, How can your name be Jazz Mia Horn? And you don't know anything about jazz. Mm. And at first, I took offense to that because I was like, First of all, that's old people's music. I don't care about that. <laughs> you know? yeah. I, I had no idea, you know, it, it, you know, I just, I was young. Um, so he, he had given me a CD that I still have. It's all scratched up and everything, but I still have it. Um, and the first song on that album was Shuli Bop. Okay. Sarah Vaughn. Sarah Vaughn, right. With John Malachi, Roy Haynes, and um, Joe Benjamin. Oh, my God. That's what did it for you. Yes. That was the holy grail. You found it. Yeah, man. I was yeah. Gonna... Very Shoot. cool. And yeah. I like, okay, I'm going to breathe like her. I'm going to sing like her. I have all those low registers. I have all the highs. You know, she, yes. she just like... The ultimate freedom with her body and her sound, and you know, and then you could watch videos. YouTube wasn't really around during that time, but you could still watch videos. They had like these DVDs that you could check out. Um, and so I was dating this guy who just was like, he just bought me so many of those DVDs. Once I got interested in it, he was like, okay, cool, I'm gonna show you this. I'm gonna show you this. Check this out, you know. And I was sitting there like, learning and listening and feeling and transcribing and soaking it all in and to the point where people would ask me like eventually once I came to New York and got on the scene people would say why do you sound so much like Sarah Vaughn like why don't you just develop your own style and I had mm -hmm. no idea what that meant until someone said that to me so it evolved you know sure but do you think that's you think that's like a necessary step to find that way in through a person that you just like idolize yeah absolutely you know? Yeah. Like that with every medium. With totally. Visual arts, with fashion, with dance. Everybody has to find that one person that really inspires them to push them to be who they truly are. Yeah. 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 But a lot of people are concerned about, oh, I'm going to sound too much like this person. I'm gonna... But that's never really the case because, you know, everyone has an individual voice. Yes. 
and your fingerprints. I, I recall the story about a master sculptor um, teaching an apprentice and making a sculpture and copying it, you know, exactly as the master was doing it. And and the apprentice said, "I'm just I'm not going to be able to develop my own thing because I'm doing exactly what you're doing." And the master said, look, your fingerprints are all over this sculpture. Mm -hmm. So it's never an exact copy. Your fingerprints are all over this mm -hmm. thing. So yeah, I think that is important advice, super important advice. And I know someone had a question um, about, you know, here, let's see if we could put this up. Ah, Selma Paris said, what advice, oh, Selma Paris, wait a minute, That may, maybe that's the horn you play. What advice would you give an advanced <laughs> high school snack level player when playing with a female singer? Um, part two. Sing, and part two, do you sing <laughs> songs mainly in one key or all of them equally? Okay, let's stick with one. Yeah. Stay out the way. <laughs> That's the first yes. part. Stay out of the way. Um, I would say learn the lyrics because that's one of the ways so that you important. can stay out of the way. So learning the lyrics, like for an, for instance, if I'm singing, please don't smile and say no, right? Knock me a kiss, you'll never miss. Shabba do be do ya. When I'm ready to go, hobo do bo hue ba do da da. And if you can smile, kind of play in between the phrasing of the style of the singer. Right. So you have to kind of get to know the singer that you're playing with. I don't do the same thing all the time. So what I'm always looking for are musicians who are uh, spiritually and intellectually in the same place as I am. For example. I like to ask a lot of questions before I hire people. <laughs> That's good. Um, if we're on an airplane and someone coughs in your face, what do you do? Right? Wow. Those are the kind of questions you're asking the musicians? I do. I sometimes wow. do. Yeah. yeah. Um, if we're at a park and you see a child and he or she drops their ice cream cone and you are walking with your children, what do you do? Because the, the scenario could be different if you're a person who's walking by yourself. The world is so yeah. weird now. Yeah. You, it's, People may think that you're weird if you just reach out to buy that kid another ice cream cone. Like, who is right. this random stranger? Right. But if you're <laughs> with children and you decide to do that, they may be a little more open and, you know, acceptable to you. So I, I ask all kinds of questions because when you play, it is improvisation. And when you're in life, like, you have to make a choice immediately. That's improvisation. So right. you have to improvise in the moment. So I, I ask random questions. Um, and according to the, you know, whatever the answer may be, I'm, I may make my decision. So I like people who, who think quick on their feet with right. their thoughts. And so you kind of have to be that, that way. Like when you're reading music, you don't read note for note. You may be singing here, but you have to kind of read ahead as you're going along, your, your reading is here and your your sound is here. So you're kind of reading like this. You have to look, you have to be able to have um, precision with your aim, especially if you're singing because you don't have frets or valves. Like I don't have valves like you have as a right. saxophone player. Everything is my ear. And if I may change my mind at the blink of an eye, um, if someone plays a dominant seventh chord, I might decide to sing the six. And if you rush and get ahead of me, the piano player is going to change to the six instead of the seven. And if you rush and don't know how to get back on your feet to get from the seventh back to the six, you can use whole tone. You can go all the way down the scale and fake something and come back. You know, you just have to be able to think quick. Um, yes. So that's, that's the first part of your question. And I hope that I answered that for you. Yes. And then Thank the you. part is, do you sing songs mainly in one key? Oh, I think I said that already too, right? Um, I think so. I sing in all different keys. All yeah. different keys. Yeah, <laughs> you got to be versatile. Yeah. But thank, hey, thank you for the question. Uh, Selmer Paris, Selmer Perry, uh, and people watching. Yes, keep them coming. We'd love to get them to them on air. Uh, so yeah, let's talk about the new album, Jasmia. It is phenomenal. Um, this one is all originals, you know, compared to the previous one, which was mostly, mostly, originals. Originals. mostly originals. Yeah, mostly originals. Um, and that I was talking to Jameson Ross last night, yeah. uh, as Matt, who is on this album, and he said that you know making the second album was actually more nerve wracking than making the first because you're kind of following. And you said a high benchmark for the first with the Grammy nom, you know, for best jazz vocal. Um, so how did coming up with the second one compared to making the first? I was kind of bored with the first. Okay. Because it wasn't my original compositions, you know, and my whole plan 
was to I've like if you look up the copyright for those for love and liberation for my songs on love and liberation like free your mind you'll you'll see that legs and arms was written in 2012 okay you'll see that free your mind was written in 2015 16 okay yeah and and this one came out in 2019 so you've been right. sitting on these songs for I a while mean, I yeah i have a yeah. lot of songs that i'm sitting on <laughs> but my thing is that when i when i first came out especially doing an album with a great record company having that advantage versus just putting out um, something independent. I wanted to make sure that the people that I'm speaking to understood that I understand the tradition of jazz music. And right. so I did a lot of standards first, because I find that a lot of, um, of my contemporaries just kind of do their thing. And right then off the bat. Sometimes it works like, and yeah, sometimes yeah. it doesn't. So for me, I was like, I want to build a foundation. Let me allow my listeners to hear my sound and my message through someone else's music. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I like to do is basically just decode the lyrics. That's a part of, of my uh, shedding, if you will. Right. Yep. I just decode the lyrics of every lyricist com um, composition, and then I kind of make it my own. Okay. You know what I mean? Do you so have like, like an example? Like, you... Yeah, like, yeah. Um, like the nearness of you. Okay. When I'm singing that song, I'm thinking of my children, you know? Mm. It's not the pale moon that excites me. So what I like to do, and this is also a part of um, one of the examples of, of um, the four elements of focus that I like to call in my book that I talk about. One of those elements is decoding the lyrics so that you can interpret the song um, with your experiences. You use your life's experiences to tell the story that has already been written. So for example, The Nearness of You. What I would do is write down the first phrase. It's not the pale moon that excites me, that thrills or delights me. Right. So you could say that that's two phrases, but sometimes okay. I don't I I don't I call a phrase. The phrase ends where I take a breath. So I may say it's not the pale moon that excites me, that thrills or delights me. That's the end of a phrase. Right. Okay. For me, other people, there's there's so many different ways that you could do it. But for me, so um, instead of it's not the pale moon that excites me, that thrills or delights me, the moon may be yellow when I am with you or when I'm with others, but with you, it is a glowing diamond. You know, just as an example, mm. this is yeah, not, yeah, yeah. it's an example, but I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking about how the moon looks when I may be by myself on the right. road compared Versus. to mm. when I'm with my children and they're like, mommy, it's a full moon or mommy, look, it's a crescent right. moon. Wow. You know, they know the different phases. So I literally put myself in a specific experience so that I can be truthful with what it is that I'm saying, like everything that's coming out of me is coming from a, a serious and truthful place within. Right. Um, and so that's, you know, that's something that has aided, but that's something that also um, I wanted to share with all of those standards that is on a social call. That's like the arc of, of what I was trying to get to. And then the second album was very exciting because I'm like, okay, cool. I don't have to like, I can just express myself completely because these are mostly my songs and I right. can be myself entirely. And if they like it, they like it. If they don't, I, I did the best that I could by being myself. You know what right. I mean? So with the social call, it was more like, let's see if they like this, you know, <laughs> let's make these cool arrangements and see how this goes. And they certainly did. And, you know, for, Exactly that reason. You so made these songs your own. And that's so interesting to hear what you say about giving the songs your own kind of personal subtext. Um, you know, really getting to it on an emotional, philosophical level, like I'm making these my own. That absolutely um, shined through. Um, and to hear you say that now, it makes total sense. Not to mention, you know, coming out with a set of standards like that these days, just like you were saying, almost feels like a uh, edgy transgressive punk rock move yeah. <laughs> because like a lot of singers you know are moving away from that they decide to go poppier you know more whatever so coming like straight from that standard school um was kind of like edgy um yeah. in a way that's what i wanted to do yeah 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 there you go <laughs> right off the bat. Here. <laughs> yeah um, but the new album, yeah, it takes up so many themes that, like I say, so relevant, so pertinent for today. Free Your Mind is a great one because it deals with something that I think all of us struggle with, yes. especially now more than ever, which is just like not being present 
like screen addiction, always being on your phone, the news yeah. cycle, you know, you're constantly just thinking other thoughts and getting that eye candy, uh, you know, from your computer or phone or whatever. And this is, you're kind of like, you got to free your mind. Yeah. You got to step away from that stuff. I'm curious because I generally need help. H how do you do that in your actual life? Um, I, I kind of struggle with anxiety, not mm. like I haven't been diagnosed, but I can feel like sometimes I'll have heart palpitations when my publicist is like, okay, you have a meeting. Am I, and, and then someone else is like, okay, you have an interview. And someone else is like, oh, this project is due. Okay. And someone else, and then my agent is like, I need this contract back. I literally just close the laptop, close yeah. the phone. And I'm like, hey girls, let's go outside yeah. or let's bake a cake or let's, you know, let's do an activity. Let's paint. Um, or I'm going to take a nap. Or I'm gonna take a bath and soak myself in some Epsom salt and just like tune out right. of the world and let everything go. Um, I also don't have a television, so I'm not like the news. Yeah, you can't. It, I, it would drive I, I you crazy. <laughs> I haven't owned a TV since I graduated college in 2013 because it just wow. now it's just like wear these clothes, buy yeah. this food, do this, and I'm just like. Ah! No, right, right. No. You know, so I, I don't. I just kind of stay away. Like, I, my grandfather loves watching the news. He's he's eighty something years old. Some people just want to be informed all the time. Yeah. yeah. So I'll call him every week, and I'm like, "What happened this week?" And he'll be like, "Oh, Trump did this. The baseball game was this. The Knicks did this. The Giants." And he gives me the whole, you know what I mean, the whole right. breakdown. I'm like, "Okay, good. I'm." Like, that's all you need. That's you it. Just digest, yes. With that and Instagram, I'm I'm set. Like, there's, I'm good. Right on. Yeah, <laughs> that's the way to do it. Hey, we got another question from the audience here. Um, Let me just grab my charger. My phone is gonna. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. It's a perfect time, Jasmia, then to pitch our new issue. This would be the summer 2020 issue. Check that out, Jasmia. All about the age of fusion. Has Chick Corea on the yeah, cover there. That is a young Chick Corea. Very handsome man with the mustache yeah, and everything. Okay. Um, this, yeah, yeah. The, all this is uh, has already been mailed to subscribers, but web articles are on our website. All the articles from this issue are on our website. Uh, you'll need a digital subscription to read them. And fortunately, we're offering a special right now: ninety nine cents for three months. We'll get you unlimited digital access to that issue and every other issue. Plus, we'll enroll you to receive a complimentary pr print issue come fall. So you sign up now, you get all the unlimited uh, digital content. And in the fall, you get a print issue on your coffee table. Um, so yeah, people watching, now's the time to sign up for your digital issue. Go to jazzes.com and click subscribe. All right. Anyway, the uh, question, we do have a question from the audience. It is from Alex, Alex Hine or Hain. He wants to know who is your favorite pianist? You played with a lot, you listen to a lot. Um, who would you say? Can I pick three? <laughs> Oh, absolutely. You can pick as many as you want. Cause I know it's impossible to pick just one. It's like, uh, yeah. Um, and I know it changes every day. I have a favorite. Uh, so much. And I'm going to have to pick six only because there's three that I listen to. And then there's three that I play with that I like. Okay. That's a great way to divvy it up. I can't, I'd like, yes. um, so I'm going to go with Ahmad Jamal. Yes, he's in uh, my top three as well. Yeah. Shirley Scott. Okay. Right on. And love her. Mary Lou Williams. Yes. Mary oh, Lou, God. born on my birthday. Oh, hey. That's yes. awesome. <laughs> and then to play with, Keith Brown, of course. Okay. Richard Gould. And who's another pianist that I like playing with? Oh, Sharp Radway. Okay. Yeah. Right on. Uh, we got six, Alex. So sorry. Thank, I, you. I, I, <laughs> thank you for the question. No, that's great. Um, yeah, and again, just to wrap it up on the album, I it's phenomenal. Everyone go listen to Love and Liberation, go listen to a social call. But I think some very high praise I was reading the press material for this album came from your godfather, I guess it was. Um, do you remember what he said after listening to the album? Yeah, Bernard, he was like, um, this is like he said a lot. But I think what you're referring, because I did an interview recently yeah. or when it came out, and I think what you're referring to is the comment that he made about it being one of the best albums and like that our ancestors would be really proud yes. of, of what I've produced. Yeah. He said it was it is what Ella or Billy or Abby or Nina would have evolved into. 
uh, yeah. today. So yeah, extremely high praise and I vouch for it, Jasmia. Yeah. Um, you yeah. are absolutely one of my favorite vocalists right now and really carrying that tradition forward. Um, in an awesome way. Again, you want to hear that great American songbook standard, absolutely swinging style with the themes of today expressed really beautifully and confidently, a little bit punk rock. Jasmine, <laughs> you're the artist for sure. Thank um, you. Hey, and you're teaching people how to do it too, because you have released a book. Is this yeah, it hasn't been anything? released yet. I just published okay. it. Um, okay. Yeah. August 21st, uh, through my eyes, the Jasmine Horn approach. And I've been working on this book for seven years. Wow. So it's That's kind of deep. It's kind of yeah. deep. Yeah. Um, but What's it's it about? Not, it's, it's not a like an autobiography or anything okay. like that. It's not a novel. Um, it's a workbook. But it kind of okay. has, you know, um, it definitely has some dialogue with me and my grandmother and my mother. Um, I'm talking about school. I'm talking about society. I'm talking about the heritage of jazz music. I'm talking about the tradition, the form. Um, but then I'm also giving tips on, like I said earlier, what I call the four elements of focus. Okay. Um, storytelling, um, stage presence, song and repertoire, and style. Um, and I think those things are very important for building your brand. They're very important for building your audience. Um, and they're not really taught in the university. No. I feel I that the university really doesn't know how to teach jazz vocals. And, I, and I'm and i sure people are going to be like, who do you think you are? <laughs> but that's okay. That's okay. Because, well, you've got the experience. I mean, yeah. and like you're saying, I this is stuff that's not as taught in jazz school. schools. Like yes. I went to school and then I'm all, I, as soon as I graduated, I started teaching at New Jersey Performing Arts Center. Um I've taught workshops all around the planet and the history and the legacy of the tradition of jazz vocals is not being taught. Like right. they completely just ignore the African-American experience um, as, as it pertains to vocals. I mean, there's obviously too way too many musicians that are of African descent or indigenous American descent for them to ignore. Right. So, you know, like Miles Dave, like, I don't even have to say their names, but it's too many of the men there to ignore. Right. But when it comes to vocals, you know, it's just kind of like, ah, you get it. And then you have vocalists who go out onto the scene. They don't know which key to sing in, don't know right. how to choose their repertoire, don't sing things that fit with their range, um, twirl their hair while they're singing. I mean, there's certain things and aspects about carrying yourself on the stage and presenting to your audience that is really not taught in school. You may learn something similar in theater, but there is still a very um, European approach. There right. is an African-centered or indigenous American-centered focus in the music in that way, especially as it pertains to jazz. So I kind of give my spiel about what could be um, which is why it's called my approach. Okay. Um, basically, me using my voice um, in full capacity, like in many ways, you know, like using it physically, but also using it um, metaphorically as well. You know, using my platform and then also using my my voice on my stage um, to bring things to awareness, but also um, healing. Like, I think one of the things that we kind of digressed on over time is that music very much like medicine is all is is healing you know yes. those pyramids a lot of people don't know what those pyramids out in Kemet out in Egypt okay. are for but there are sounds and vibrations that were used when building those pyramids that helped people to develop those pyramids. And I find that if we do that again and use traditional sacred music in the same way that the Native Americans did, in the same way that the ancient Egyptians did, in the same way that a lot of the African traditions all over the world are doing, you know, when you think about like different religious traditions, if you think about the Muslim um, the nation of Islam or or the Muslim religion or tradition, you know, they start most of their prayers by singing Allahu Akbar, God is the greatest. And then you think about some of like the Haitian traditions, like some of the Vodun traditions, they yeah. use song to defeat 
whoever um, their colonizer or whoever their enemy enemy was or is. And right. music has always been that mechanism that can get you to where you're going. I mean, a lot of um, workers, people who go to work, every time I get on the train or you get on the train in the morning, people have their earbuds on. <laughs> you know, music, when you get yes. on the airplane, you, you hear music right away. Yes. Before there's a prompt, you hear music. Um, when you look at a movie, a film, you hear music. Right. You know, music is the essence of everything. It's the way um, it. Yeah. And so I, I think that we've forgotten that that also can be used as a healing mechanism. So there are like when I say that it's a workbook, it's also a book that shares different mantras that you can sing to yourself. Wow. Um, one of the things that I had a really hard time with in my life in general was being from Dallas, Texas, especially having Dallas or Texas be the last state that was annexed. There was a lot of overt racism that I experienced as a child. Like for instance, when I was eight years old, I saw a man be lynched. Um, and that kind of, that was very traumatic for me. You know, I have daughters now and I, I could only, you know, things are, things of that nature are, are still happening in our society yeah. in 2020, unfortunately. But then how do you, you know, how do you, and not necessarily get over it, but how do you progress through that? Like, right. how do you deal with that? How do you deal with that being your reality consistently day by day? And one of the things that was very um, disheartening for me is that when I walked out of my home, there was always someone um, that was not of my race looking at me in a very um, condemning way. And so like fast forward to 2012, the first time that I ever leave the United States and go to Europe, um, I went to Russia and and I went to, let's see, Odessa is in Ukraine. So I went to Ukraine and I went to Russia. Okay. The same way that those people in Texas had been looking at me and treating me was very similar to those same faces in Russia and the Ukraine. Mm. And so when I came back, I was like, this is like my audience is going to be mostly Europeans if I'm try if I'm going to consistently be a traditional jazz singer. So I got to get over this no matter what. My purpose on this planet is to bring light to these people, no matter how they treat me, no matter how disrespectful they they may be. I'm put in this position for a particular reason. I can yeah. probably change it with my vibration. So yeah. I said, OK, what I'm going to do is mirror work. And in the book, there is an exercise called mirror work. And what you do is you use the first three elements that you've already. So the first element is like transcribing the lyrics to do like for the nearness of you. As I said, you transcribe the lyrics and you write out your own interpretation of the story. Once you do that, you do don't forget the lyrics. So you say them over and over and over and over again and you write them down over and over again and you recite them as you would a poem versus okay. you don't think about the melody, melody or, okay. any of that. You only recite the words so that you can connect with the etymology of what you're actually saying. Okay. And then the third part of that is mirror work. So you look into the mirror and you do everything that you did for step one and two into the mirror. Because the thing is you can lie to other people. Like when you look at people and you say, look at me, I'm as helpless as a kid in up a tree. They may not believe you. Right. But if you're looking at yourself and you sing that, you might have to start over a million times until you, you can't lie to yourself. You can't lie to yourself. Yeah, you can't lie to yourself. You can't. Yeah, you know it. So for me, it's like, no matter what, how those people look at me, no matter what their faces look like, I know what my lips look like, my right. nose, my eyebrows, my eyes, my face. I know if I sing like this, how my nose is going to scrunch and how my cheeks widen. I know everything about my face. So I'm right. comfortable within myself so that whenever someone looks at me weird, it may be that they've never heard a voice that's as powerful as mine coming from a very small body. It may be they've never heard jazz in the way that I play it. Who knows? Who cares? For me to be able to present myself properly on my stage and, and give my audience what they've paid for and what they came to see, I have to be comfortable in myself completely. Um, totally. And so... That's the mirror work. That's that's that exercise. I love it. And and you know, it's a similar advice in writing, whereas you can't write to necessarily impress other people. Mm -mm. Um the best you can do is communicate the joy you have for your subject, your writing, 
put it into the writing and hope people just feel a little bit of that, you know, how much you enjoy doing it, you know, how much you enjoyed the process. So uh, it's incredible that you're able to write a book, um, you know, because it's a different kind of writing than writing, um, um, you know, lyrics. And yeah. uh, it it's, takes, ju it's just so much work. And, uh, you know, did you, did you find that like you had that critical voice on your shoulder of like Every day. Like <laughs> yeah. when got to the editing process i was like yeah. oh god am i ever gonna get through with this book and, you did. It. <laughs> and it's awesome coming out august 21st because i saw somebody ask about it on facebook coming out august 21st it drops so very cool um we will wrap i guess with just if we had a few more audience questions okay. um jeff if you want to pull some up ah okay allison Thabi wants to know what is your approach to writing lyrics do you write them before after the music or is it different every time Thanks for the question, um, it's different every time lyrics come um so lyrics is lyrics are words communication you know whenever i'm going to the store i may say like i just wrote a song called play them changes and it really isn't about playing the changes in music it's really about improvising in life like when something happens to just play the changes you know yeah. and that's something that just came came to me walking to the store and somebody was bothering me and I was like oh god and then I went into the store and I forgot my mask and I was like oh god but you have to you know <laughs> yeah you have to adapt <laughs> you gotta play the changes you gotta play right. the changes yep. so yep. you know, the lyrics come and go um sometimes I'll I'll be home and I'll literally sit down and concentrate on a particular subject and I'll say, all right, I want to talk about this specifically. So then I have I have a lyric journal. And basically, I just whenever something comes into my mind or sometimes the melody will come first hmm. and then I'll hear the melody. Maybe like a month later, I record it. I have a little record. I record everything. Yeah. Everything. Even if I think I'm not going to like it or it sounds whack in the moment. Sit Two weeks later, I may sit down at the piano and I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember I wrote that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. this is how it goes. And then it's a whole nother song. So I, I keep everything. And sometimes I go back to things that I thought that I may not have liked. And then I kind of refurbish it and it's cool again. It's hip, which is kind of what happened um, with when I say um, it kind of it started off when I say stop, when I say go, pick up the ball and show me your moat. I don't remember. But I was like, I don't like this. And my daughter came in and she's like, when I say stop. And I was like, what? What? Tell mommy. Tell mommy. Yeah. yeah. You know, so it varies, you know, it it really does vary. Yeah. I hope we answered her question. No, that's very cool. And that's what I must have been what my daughter loved about this song too. When I say stop, no, you just the suspense. It's yeah. <laughs> uh, it's awesome. It's awesome. Um, okay, and let's see. Patrice wants to know. Uh, how did you develop your unique singing delivery? Um like you use a whole range of techniques and, you know, you know, obviously your range and dynamic range is amazing, but uh, I guess, how did you, who helped you develop? How can we answer Patrice? Hold on one second. I'm so sorry. No, you're supposed to be in the bed. Mommy's almost finished with this meeting, but you're supposed to be in the bed. There's nothing in here. Okay, hold, go Jasmine ahead. Jasmine is biggest fan. Okay, now come over here. Give me kisses. You can't invite on me. No, I can't. I love you. You too. Go get in the bed. It's not funny. I don't like when you do it. It's not funny. All right. When I say stop. The biggest fan. <laughs> Oh, is that your co-creator of When I Say Stop yes, right there? Is. All right. Not, she's five and she doesn't like to go to bed. She, no, she, I, who Red's does? going to bed. Who does? Yeah. Okay. So Patrice, there was someone named Patrice and she was asking me a question. Your, your unique singing delivery. Um, how did you develop it? And so. Ooh. I can take that number. I how to answer that yeah. question. Um, can you elaborate maybe a little bit more? It's it's kind of a vague question because I don't. We'll get I, back. How about Mary wants to know what's your favorite era in jazz? Ooh, um, favorite era. 
the right now. I I like yeah. I would say it, between swing and and right now, like the swing era, the big band. I Lindy Hop. So oh, do you? Nice. Oh, what? <laughs> What? You get your Lindy yeah. Hop on. Absolutely. Um, so I love that whole era of when people were just like. When it was the dance music. When it was a dance music, yeah. when it was about feeling good, when it was about being out there in the dance floor. Cool. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yeah. Maybe yeah. we can help Patrice out a little bit. Who were some of the, you know, in addition to Sarah Vaughn, who I know you love, um, who are some of the other artists that helped provide that way in, like we were talking about before? Okay. The um, idea of I can do that. I can do that. You guys know Rochelle Pharrell? <laughs> I am aware of Rochelle Farrell. Yes, that's the okay. Secret. I wouldn't. Con I wouldn't consider her. I mean, I don't really like titles, but <sighs> titles are good for marketing. I I wouldn't consider her a jazz singer. However, yeah, but don't you cover one of her songs on the new album? Yeah, on the yes. album, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, cause she's she's like even now she's my biggest inspiration, like alive. Wow. So, yeah. So. I heard her music with Will Downing and I heard like what I really appreciate about her is that she plays the piano. Yeah. She writes her own songs, all of them. There isn't like an album where there's just like a little bit her first album, she did all standards. Then after that, right. she's like, nah, I'm I'm just gonna be me. Yeah. <laughs> and I, you know, I really appreciated that. She did she not she doesn't wear like a whole heap of heavy makeup and you know, she's really true to her style, whatever that is. And, you know, musically and as far as anthropology is concerned, she always wears what she wants to wear. And she really just is about the music. Yes. She's about the music. It's hard to find that, um, you know, coming up on the scene here in New York, you know, from the gospel scene of which, you know, I'm I, back home, you didn't have to just sing the part you also had to dress the part so if you think mm. about gospel music today it's more of the glitz and glamour yes people right. sing their hearts out but they also have to have on the latest trends of fashion and it has to be i think that's a beautiful thing but that sometimes sometimes can hide you know fashion and 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 makeup and all those things for me should be um just a little bit of an embellishment, you know, right. like it falls on a tree. Or right. The, and in service the of the artist, obviously, yeah. and the music. Yeah. 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 And okay. I don't, I'm not, I don't get that a lot um, today. I don't get it a lot. You don't, you don't really see that a lot. There's all always this, you know, other mechanism. Like people are kind of like hiding behind the, the microphone, like these really beautiful gowns and this, over, you know, makeup and big old lashes. Yeah. It's too much. <laughs> so I really appreciate Rochelle Pharrell because it's like she's just naked on the stage and she gives Honestly. you her whole entire heart, all of her being, her spirit, her sensuality. I mean, it's just like, mm. There you go. And well, I hopefully that can yeah. answer your question, Patrice. It's a little Sarah oh, Vaughn. Yeah. It's a little Rochelle Pharrell. It's a little Nat King Cole. Yeah. And uh, your people watching, you just after this interview, just go listen to Jasmine Horn. Just Thank go you. listen to a social call. Go listen to Love and Liberation. The book is coming out in August. Go pre-order your copy. Um, <laughs> and that's truly what I love about your music, Jasmine, is you're so you, you're so honest, you're so candid, you're so good. This is so very much you. And that you're and yet your music is so universal, relatable to everyone. I feel your, you know, uh, the nearness of you on a gut level. Also, because I used to sing that song to my daughter, my first daughter, oh, as she was going to sleep. Yes. So it's another connection you yeah. and I have. <laughs> So, uh, and I feel that that's, that's the power of your music. Even when it's somebody else's lyrics, it, it really sinks into your gut level. Um, it's felt music. So it's awesome. Um, Jasmia, thank you so much for doing this. This has been awesome. Uh, a real treat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. I definitely All right. appreciate you. Yes. I will, uh, see you later, maybe in person one day. Uh, but until then, it has been great having you on the last call. Thank you. Cheers. Bye, Jasmia. Cheers. <laughs> so, yes, thank you to Jasmia Horn for stopping by the last call tonight. 
Go listen to her albums. Go buy her albums. They're out right now. A Social Call, Love and Liberation, and be on the lookout for that book when it comes out August 21st. Thank you for watching. Thank you for submitting your questions. Anybody watching, if you are an independent artist, be sure to visit uh, our website and check out our Inside Track program. It is the best way to get your music in front of uh, a jazz's editor's ears. And all you do is you go to uh, jazz's.com, click Inside Track, you submit everything about your album, personnel. Uh, you can send us a link to SoundCloud or Bandcamp, your album cover, track list. It comes directly to my inbox. It comes directly to every jazz's editor's inbox. And you never know. You can wind up with a review. You can wind up uh, in the pages of our magazine. You can wind up on this very podcast. So I encourage you to go check it out. All right. That'll do it for the last call. I'm going to close down the bar. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. I'm Brian Zimmerman. Thanks for watching, everyone.